I'll start with uh, Dr. Tarek and, and ask um, uh, the question, can Arab and Islamic values be reconciled with democracy? Uh, uh, on this particular question, I, I, I would have thought perhaps Daly and Shadi, having worked with some of the data and some of the political parties at close range, might be able to start us off, and I'd be more that's, than happy to. That's great. Who, who wants to jump in? I can, I can start. Uh, the answer is clearly yes. And actually, I, I want to go beyond the question to, to why are we asking this question? Why is this question uh, uh, seriously, uh, sim I mean, asked every, uh, essentially everywhere I go? Both empirical evidence from survey research after survey research has shown that democratic values are uh, something that people in the Arab world have aspired to for years and years. But not only do we have polling, we also have protests. We have people who risk their lives and, and did more um, for the values of democracy than, than you know, many people who live in democracies today in terms of uh, all that they were willing to sacrifice for their dignity and for their freedom. I think we have to, at some point, accept this as just a fact, uh, something we accept and move on and ask different questions. What if it is, if, if we accept that the values of democracy are something that clearly are, are ones that uh, Arabs aspire to, why, what has been um, the, the problem so far? What, what are the actual obstacles to moving to democratic uh, reform? It, it isn't the values. I can clearly tell you that from everything we've seen and from not only what people say, but what people do. So I think we, we need to move on and ask, what is, what is standing in the way? And just to build on what Delia said, I mean, up until this past January, there was this perception that Arabs were politically passive and apathet apathetic, and we were trying to explain that. But I think what's so interesting now is that it's the flip side then now, why do Arabs protest so much? Why is there this ethic of protest and demonstration spreading all throughout the Arab world? And just take one example. In Bahrain, there have been at least two protests where more than 100,000 people took to the streets out of a population of about 500,000. That means around one out of every five Bahrainis was out in the streets calling for their freedom and asking for change. And that kind of percentage of involvement is really unprecedented. I was just talking to Dahlia earlier, correct me if the numbers aren't right, but around six million at least Egyptians mm -hmm. over the course of the 18 days took to the streets. These are incredible, incredible numbers. So that should put to rest, as Dahlia said, definitively that there is some kind of cultural clash. With that said, though, I think one point that's worth mentioning, there is a difference between democracy and liberal democracy. So I think Arabs are fully on board with democracy as a system of government. That doesn't mean they want it to be American-style, liberal, separation of church and state. And I, and you know, for example, I mean, no one calls themselves a secularist in the Arab world. That's a bad word. And I think to some extent, this region is going to continue to be immune to secularization. And Westerners might be uncomfortable with that, but I think it's something we have to accept. Um, I think just more broadly what I, and, and this is an observation as someone who's worked in the US for many years and uh, had to face this precise question from your colleagues at universities and think tanks. Uh, why are you guys an exception to the waves of democratization that are taking place elsewhere in the world? Why isn't there a single functioning democracy in the Arab world? How could totalitarian regimes, dictatorships, endure for such a long period of time? That was the context in which questions about culture and the role of religion. And in fact, I would argue there was a cottage industry that sprung up in the last 10 years in the US post 9-11 where people started sort of blaming Islam, blaming culture, <laughs> looking for the culprits within the religion itself. Is it the text? Is it the practice? Is it the mullahs? Is it What these revolutions have very importantly done for us is to kind of debunk those very scholarly and scientific notions that people for a very long time had taken for granted. 
And that raises some very big questions about what do we actually mean by culture? What do we mean by religion? And what really accounted for the durability of dictatorships for so long in the Arab world? I think this is extremely refreshing. Uh, it's, uh, it makes us also re-examine some of our own tenets. I mean, you would hear it also in the Arab world where people would say, yeah, we're, not, we're different. You would actually start hearing this. The sense of pessimism and, and defeatism became part of our... Uh, I'm of the mind, and I subscribe to this as a, as, a, as a scholar or as somebody who's written about this, that even our notions of culture need to be updated and refreshed. We need notions of culture that are dynamic, that are open to change, that can accommodate various uh, localities and, and, and forms of government and conditions on the ground. Uh, I'm of the view that a lot of what we call culture nowadays in the Arab world, not just in politics, but also in, uh, in, in the public sphere, our tendency, for example, to insist on certain types of jobs, on, on being served, on, on entitlements for the state, these are all functions of how societies have been constructed recently. You change the incentives, you change these parameters, our people will be just as dynamic, just as entrepreneurial, and just as courageous and self-empowering as any other people in the world. Shall I say something? Please. You agree with me this time? I will tell you something which will please you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At last, Dr. Tarek. <laughs> I will tell you a practical story. It's difficult to be among academic here, but anyway, I'll go to my practical experience. <laughs> Uh, one day I was invited to appear in a program which well known in Britain, if some of you lived in Britain, it is, date, uh, so, sorry, it is uh, Newsnight. So uh, when, when they have uh, to confront, confront somebody, they bring me in. You know, they know that <laughs> the program will be very heated. Yeah. So the British foreign minister was just coming back from Libya. And Britain at that time glorified Gaddafi how he was reformed, how he is a good man, how Libya actually suffered under the sanction, all these nice things. So I was you know, sitting and he was just you know, talking about Libya and you know, how it is now pro-West. Uh, and he said, we are going to establish full diplomatic relation with Libya and also we will actually uh, bring Libya to the international fold again and it is our job as British. I said to him, sir, I would like to ask you a question. He said, yes. You are going to restore your relationship with a brutal dictator. Okay, now you want to bring him to the international fold again. Did you put any conditions on him to improve his human rights records? Did you put any conditions on him actually to introduce some sort of democracy, Western democracy, liberal values to his own people? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, simply because there is a sort of democracy in Libya which we do understand and respect. Mm. Wow. Literally. 